So here's my tagline for Glow. All right, when you carry Club Glow, you're carrying, you got 10 sermons in your pocket. You got 20 sermons in your pocket. Or as my buddy Nelson Ernst, who started the Glow Tracks, as he says, you got Mark Finley in your pocket. So you guys nailed it. Some of the things is we've got to be winsome witnesses. If we're winsome, maybe we can win some to Jesus. The other important thing is that we need to follow Christ's methods, which is he won their confidence, which means trust. And then he bade them follow me. So this is very important. And we want to be friends. We want to make our way into their heart first before we start trying to share spiritual truth. So now for those who are just joining, I love how Pastor Myers came up with this whole weight training. As we're waiting for the Lord to come, in the meanwhile, we are to occupy. And the way we're supposed to occupy is we are to be winning souls for his kingdom. Hence the reason why I set this up in my kitchen, because this is where there's a lot of um, serving going on. And also the lighting happens to be good in here. Now, the series that I'm doing for you guys is called No Greater Bliss. And I get this from a quote from Sister White, where she says, there is no greater bliss on this side of heaven than in winning souls to Christ. And I can attest to the veracity of this quote. I've done a lot of exciting things and there's very few things that are as gratifying and satisfying as winning someone to Jesus. Now, I am fully aware that as soon as someone talks about sharing, soul winning or evangelism, this can invoke fear or feelings of uncomfortableness into the hearts of many people. I have a friend, she was in my dental office She's a zealous and passionate Seventh Adventist. She told me she was on an airplane. She had an opportunity to share Jesus with somebody. She was so nervous. Her knees were shaking. She was praying and asking Jesus to help her to be brave and courageous. She said she was paralyzed by fear. I'm sure some of you can relate. Many are uncomfortable with introducing people to Jesus. Now, some of the most common reasons for this. One is you don't know what to do. You're afraid they might ask you a question. You don't know how to answer the question. Fear of saying the wrong thing. And if you compound this with someone who is shy or introvert, it can be overwhelming. Now, reports estimate that roughly 30 to 50% of the population are introverted. For those of you who don't know Pastor Myers personally, Pastor Myers is introverted. And you'd be surprised a lot of the well-known speakers out there are introverted. If you have a room full of musicians or artists, the number can go up. I have a very special place in my heart for introverts. I love introverts. I married one. My wife is a genuine introvert. She is what I call a high functioning introvert. This means people who are close to us, they think that my wife is super social. But if you really get to know her, total introvert. She's happy as a clam at home. My twin brother is an introvert and my wife gave birth to two daughters they're both introverts at all as well. However, we do have two dogs and they're both very extroverted. Now, when my wife and I get onto an airplane, she makes sure that I sit next to the stranger because I can carry on a conversation for the entire flight. And what my wife does is she sits quietly next to me on the other side and she does what I call introverting. That's what introverts like to do. They like to be left alone and that's how they recharge. Now, a great analogy for the extroverts, because sometimes the extroverts don't really understand the introverts, is the gold, gold coin analogy. See, when an introvert wakes up in the morning, they have a handful of gold coins. And every time they have an interaction with somebody, they are giving a gold coin away. And pretty soon, if they have too many social interactions, they're depleted of the gold coins and your typical introvert goes to bed at night with zero gold coins. Can anyone guess how many gold coins an extrovert wakes up with? And feel free to put it in the chat box, okay? I love interaction. How many gold coins does an extrovert wake up with? That's right. You guys, hey, Clint nailed it. He said none. We extroverts wake up with zero gold coins, but every time we have an interaction, guess what? We get a gold coin. And so we love interacting with people. We get energized by being with people. And at the end of the night, when we go to bed, I had a slide of it. We have a pile of gold coins. So I'm trying to help the, uh, the extroverts to kind of understand what's going on between the introvert and extrovert. Now, what many extroverts don't realize is that something as simple as an icebreaker at church 
And we tell people, we want you to get into small groups. Can make an introvert start looking for the exit sign. One person shared on Reddit that they went on a three week backpacking trip just to avoid two family reunions. And all the introverts are not like, yep, I get it. When we hear, when we hear everything is canceled because of the coronavirus, most of the extroverts were like, oh no. And the introverts are silently saying, yes. For some introverts, they don't mind the text, but they dread the phone call. Some introverts will literally watch the phone ring until it goes to a missed call. When you invite an introvert and they respond with, I'll let you know, I'll check my schedule or I'll text you. Those answers can mean that they are not interested and would rather stay at home where it is peaceful and quiet. And we need to be cognizant of this. I shared the above about introverts and extroverts to underscore two points. The first point, that I'm very sympathetic to those who do not naturally feel comfortable to engage with strangers and how daunting it can feel for some to try and witness to others when it seems so easy for some people to share Jesus. And the second reason, in evangelism, we are dealing with the minds of people and there is much interpersonal dynamics that occur. So especially for us extroverts, it is very important for us to understand that people are wired differently. And this will help us to be more effective in our interpersonal relationships with those we are trying to reach. Now, I have great news for you all today because I'm married to a bona fide introvert and I know that engaging and interacting with complete strangers can be daunting and intimidating at best and outright frightening and stressful at worst for some people. The beauty of the subset of evangelism, of evangelism that I will be highlighting today is that it is so easy. You can even do it without talking to anyone. Now, in the Bible, there were two brothers. Andrew and Peter. Andrew in the Bible was an introvert. His brother Peter was an extrovert. Andrew is quiet and he says very little. His brother Peter is large and in charge. In the Bible, when Peter had nothing to say, he'd say something anyways. And Mark 9, 6 is an example of this. On the converse, Andrew is an introvert. We don't see him preaching. He's not a mover and a shaker like his brother Peter, but he is one of Jesus's disciples. Andrew is only mentioned three times in the book of John. Each time he is mentioned, he is quietly doing just one thing. He's just connecting people to Jesus. In John chapter one, verse 40, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first finds his brother, Simon. And what does he do? He brings his brother to Jesus. Now, six chapters later in chapter six, what you have is a story of the little lad with the two fish and the five barley loaves. And here you see him bringing this little lad to meet Jesus. In verse 12, you see Philip and Andrew, and you know what they're doing is they're connecting some of the Greeks to Jesus that wanted to meet him. When I look at this pattern, I love how he first brought one of his family members to Jesus. Then he brings someone who is part of the fold to Jesus. We call this inreach, right? And then he brings an outsider to Jesus. I like this progression because we are told that we are to begin in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and then to the outer ends of the world. We are to start right where we are at and then move out. All we see Andrew doing is quietly connecting people to Jesus. Andrew and Peter are not wired the same. Not everyone is called to preach like Peter. Good news. Sister White says not all are called to preach, but all are called to share. Now, normally in my PowerPoint presentation, I have a picture. And there's a glow track sitting and I asked people, do you know where this glow track is sitting? And it's sitting on top of the toilet paper dispenser in a public restroom. Why do I have that picture on there? This message came to the glow office about, uh, about a year and a half ago. This is what someone wrote. I found a pamphlet in the bathroom and I'd like to know more about the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Yes, I'd like Bible studies too. I found the pamphlet and I was impressed that God opens and closes doors. Just imagine if you're the one who placed a glow literature track right in a public restroom. No one even saw you do this. And now somebody wants a Bible study. Can you imagine this? Years ago, I was getting out of the car with my friend who's an orthodontist. And as soon as he jumped out, he took a glow track and he put it on another car next to his car. Didn't take hardly any time to do this. Just place a glow track on another vehicle. But would this do any good? 
My friend Tara shares a story. When the Pope came to the United States a number of years ago, they did a big glow rally to try to share as many glow tracks. I think they were trying to shoot to share a million glow tracks in Philadelphia. So her and her friend, they had put glow tracks on all these cars. And then they came back a number of hours later to put more glow tracks on the cars. And here's what happened. As they left, someone drove really quick and almost hit her roommate. The guy was trying to get her attention and tried to hand her a $100 bill. He told her roommate, this morning, I told God I would end my life tonight, but, but if he was real, to show me or I will go through with my plans. How did you know to put this promise of peace small booklet on my car door? I read it. I cried. I know God is real, but I didn't think he would answer me. Please take this $100 bill. But her housemate said, I cannot accept your money. It is all God. I'm simply doing what God told me to do to share his love with others, to others. One glow track on someone's car just saves someone's life. But people think, yeah, but if I leave a glow track on a car, it's going to fall off. It's going to land on the street. What a waste. A young man found a discarded glow track on the ground and he picked it up. The glow track was titled, Why I Go to Church on Saturday. He then went home to his mom. Why do we go to church on Sunday instead of Sabbath? His mom froze. Can anyone guess why his mother froze? She was once an Adventist, but had departed from the faith and was taking the kids to a Sunday church. The young man's interest continued to grow, though. He began attending the Adventist Academy and has become a baptized member of our church. You don't even need to talk to somebody. And you can connect people and win people to Jesus just by sharing literature. No one has an excuse not to share literature. I'm going to tell you words from the pen of inspiration, what Sister White tells us. We should treat as a sacred treasure. When you think of sacred treasure, what's sacred treasure? Would that be like a copy of the Declaration of Independence? Sacred treasure, every line of printed matter that comes from our publishing houses. Even the fragments of a pamphlet or of a periodical should be regarded as a value. Who can estimate the influence that a torn page containing the truth of the third angel's message may have upon the heart of some seeker after truth? Every page that comes from the press is a ray of light from heaven to shine into the byways and the hedges, shedding light upon the pathway of truth. Let us remember that somebody would be glad to receive every page that we can spare. If you believe the quote that I just read, you cannot but value printed literature. We are told it is a ray of light. One other story. At the Pope rally, they say it was the best place to hand out literature. You know why? People thought it was Pope memorabilia. So people are wanting the literature that's being handed out. With this gal, she is at the airport, waiting at the airport when this event was over. And she said that the Holy Spirit kept impressing her to go speak to some guy that was standing there with Pope paraphernalia on, memorabilia on. She is shy. She, is shy. She, could, she did not want to talk to him, but she could not have peace until she went to give him some glow or to speak with him. Finally, she went up to give him a glow track. The guy tells her, I came all the way from the Dominican Republic to find spiritual answers and peace from the Pope. Then someone gave me this booklet. I didn't feel... Okay, the guy tells her, I came all the way to see the Pope, but when I saw him, I didn't feel anything. He came because he wanted a spiritual feeling in his life. And yet here he sees the Pope, he doesn't feel anything. Then someone gave me this booklet and he shows her the promise of peace glow track and said that last night he went home after the mass and read the track. He also watched a video on the Pope and said he learned so much, but he also said he believes he came all the way to Philadelphia, not for the Pope, but for the peace that the booklet gave him. To know that God loves him and forgives him was something he needed. The glow track was able to do something for him that the Pope could not. And you know what this girl said? She goes, I'm so glad I spoke to that guy. I wouldn't have known the impact these glow tracks are having on people. These glow tracks are powerful. Now, do you know why I believe? There's two reasons why I believe people do not share literature. I'm going to share the first reason why now. It's because people do not understand and they underestimate the power of literature. That God uses this literature. And when we use this, we are told the secret of success is the union of divine power and human effort. And when you and I put forth the effort to share literature, then God blesses with his divine power 
and it can be life changing and win people to Jesus. Now, years ago, many companies were coming up with the first, what do we call them now? Um, MP3 players. Many, many companies, everybody was on a race to create the first MP3 player, player and get it branded. And all these companies struggled. Do you know why? They couldn't convey to the public what an MP3 player was. What is it? I mean, you all know what a Walkman is. Some of you are old enough. Remember those cool yellow Sony Walkmans? I used to have one of those. And then they were replaced by Discmans. The problem with the disc players was that they would skip. And then they came up with the MP3 player. But how do you convey to people what it is? They call this an audio digital player. It's got so many megabytes of memory. And so no one could really get people to buy this. Well, Apple is what Apple does best. You know what they don't, what they do, what they don't do is they don't tell you what it is. They always tell you why you should have one. And they came up with a tagline. You know what their tagline is? 1,000 songs in your pocket. Who wouldn't want to have 1,000 songs in your pocket? And with that tagline, they blew up the MP3 uh, player industry, the iPod, and no one can even compete with Apple since then. You don't hear of any other company, Sony or Toshiba or anyone else that's selling um, uh, MP3 players. So here's my tagline for Glow. All right. When you carry Glow, Glow you're carrying, you've got 10 sermons in your pocket. You got 20 sermons in your pocket. Or as my buddy Nelson Ernst, who started the Glow Tracks, as he says, you got Mark Finley in your pocket. You might be shy. You might be an introvert. You might not know what to say. But you know what? You got sermons and you're carrying these sermons in your pocket and you can leave these sermons and spread them, as Sister White says, like the leaves of autumn. Now, someone might remember the last presentation from two weeks ago and be thinking, yeah, but I thought we weren't supposed to share anything spiritual until we won their trust. So I want to make sure I um, clarify this. What I do is when I'm on an airplane and when I'm ending the, the, the flights over, and, I, and I'm pretty confident I will never see this person again. That's when I leave them with literature. When I'm at a place and it's going to be a one-time encounter, then I want to leave them with a spiritual gem or spiritual blessing. So I want to make that very clear. Now, how do you share glow tracks? Where, when, and how to share glow tracks or literature is only limited by your imagination. When you go out to eat and you leave a tip, leave a glow track with that tip. But the worst thing you can do is leave a stingy tip with that glow track. So please make sure if you're going to leave a glow track, make sure you leave a generous tip. Gas station pumps. You pump gas. Most of us all do. Afterwards, you just place a glow track. And I have pictures of this, which was on my PowerPoint. But you just place a folded glow track right there in the gas pump so that the next person who's going to get gas is going to see that glow track. I like the gas pumps now that have diesel and regular gas. Because then I can leave two glow tracks. One gentleman called in asking for Bible studies. When they asked him where he had received the track, you know what he said? It was inside a book that he had bought at the thrift store. Can you imagine that? You donate books. You just place a glow track in there. And down the road, someone's reading this book. And now they want Bible studies. Any magazine or book you see, that's a great place to put a glow track. You're on the airplane. Now airplanes don't do this. But before, airplanes used to have those magazines right in front of you. What a perfect place to place a glow track because you have a captive audience because you know you're really bored when you read that magazine because you're stuck in an airplane. You have nowhere to go. When you're in a department store, you can slip that thing into the coat pocket of a suit or a jacket. Could you imagine someone buys a jacket a couple months later? They happen to reach into the pocket and guess what they find? Spiritual gems. Public bathroom stalls are one of my favorite places to leave them. And I'm not trying to brag, but I can hit seven to eight bathroom stalls in less than a minute and just place a glow track in each one of the stalls. Easiest way to leave it on a car is I just fold it halfway and put it right in where the door handle is. Now, I think it was the summer before last. I'm driving on the road, and all of a sudden, there's a very nice gentleman encouraging me to pull over. He had fancy, colorful lights shining. And here this guy is encouraging me to pull over. And I'm happy because now I've got an opportunity to share literature with this gentleman. 
Sometimes people come knocking on your door. Well, he was encouraging me to make a nice donation to our local government. And at the end, when he was done with what he was doing, I tried to hand him a great controversy. And he refused. He says he's not allowed to receive anything. That, that made me a little bit irked and annoyed because that's what I should have told him when he gave me the citation. I should have told him, I'm not allowed to re receive anything. But, oh, well, he wouldn't, take the, he wouldn't take the great controversy. But when I mailed the citation in, all I had to do was put a glow track right into that citation. So my point of telling you this story is, one way or another, every interaction is an opportunity for you to share literature with people. Now, for those who aren't timid or shy, like me, I like handing literature to anyone I encounter. I, was, I fly almost weekly because my work is up in Washington and my wife and kids are in California. The Alaska airline agent scanned my boarding pass. Usually what I'll say is, here's something for your good service. And I gave her a glow track. The lady behind me exclaimed, that's so sweet. Guess who was getting the next one? When I got to the gate of the airplane, she was right behind me. For her, I handed her a great controversy. Again, she exclaimed, that's so sweet. Now, I fly almost weekly and people ask me all the time, don't you get tired of flying? I don't. And here's the reason why. Because every trip is like a mission opportunity when you're sharing literature. I have an opportunity to share literature with the Uber driver, the TSA agents, my seatmate, the stewardesses. I leave glow tracks in the public restrooms. Now, one of the most challenging people to share literature with are the TSA agents. They usually tend to be grumpy. Sometimes they're not really nice. And oftentimes they will just say, nope, we're not allowed to take anything. And they won't even receive it. I discovered that if I can get them to smile, laugh, or talk to me, they will almost always accept the glow track. Because the moment they smile, laugh, or talk to me, I've opened the door to their heart just a little bit. I've had some TSA agents that are super fast at processing people. You know, some of them are slow. They look like they're bored. But some of them are really fast. What I like to say, I go, they should pay you double because you're twice as fast as the other guys. They will almost always smile and nod. And then that gives me an opportunity to hand them a glow track. One of the TSA agents had a really nice fresh haircut. I said, I need to get my haircut where you got your haircut because you have a nice tight fade. The guy has a big smile on his face and he goes, my mom cut my hair. I said, no way. He's grinning ear to ear. As soon as he's smiling, I know I've got a green light to share literature with him. Say something nice. It opens doors. The TSA lady was smiling and looked very kind. When they are super nice, this is something I like to say. Are you new at your job? Usually they will say no. Why? I say, because you're very nice. I hope you stay nice. It is my way of encouraging them to stay nice because many of the TSA agents are grumpy. The lady replied, I'm nice because I am whole. I said, I'm a dentist, and this is one of my favorite books that I like giving out to my patients. She said, you're a dentist? Can you help me find a good dentist? I said, sure. This gave me the opportunity to write my number inside the book. As soon as I got through the security and was walking to my gate, she had texted me the following. This is Rose. The wonderful God I serve is what keeps me smiling. This week has been very difficult, but look at the scripture I read today and now your book. Thank you. Stay blessed. One time, a TSA security lady wanted to check my luggage. When she was done, I did my little canvas tour, and she says, so you're the dentist who gives out books. Apparently, I have a reputation at the Sacramento airport now. She goes, I saw one on the table, and I took it. Sister White tells us, carry with you wherever you go a package of select tracks, which you can hand out as you have opportunity. I was going for a walk with my wife and daughters on a Sabbath afternoon, and I just grabbed a bunch of literature. I had a great controversy, uh, an abridged version. I had glow tracks. I had just different stuff to hand out. And we've got cute little dogs. And so when you go for a walk with little dogs, everyone wants to stop by and say your dogs and pet your dogs. So it's a great way to leave literature with people. A lady happened to walk by, and I gave her, of all the different things, I happened to give her a book called Struggling with Why. And as she walks away, after she received the book, she turns back and says, I'm struggling. And thanks us for the book. And all I could think was of all the different books I could have given her, well, how is it that I happened to give her that book? Well, that's easy because God orchestrated that divine appointment. And all I could think was, God, you are so good. You had me give her the exact book that she needed. 
The present work like sharing literature may look small, inconsequential, and unimportant, but we are told let every believer scatter broadcast tracts. Here's what she says. Let every seventh Adventist ask himself, what can I do to proclaim the third angel's message? How are we to give it? The distribution of our literature is one means by which the message is to be proclaimed. Let every believer scatter broadcast tracts and leaflets and books containing the message of this time. So you know what? Some of you, you may be like Peter and you have no problem going up in the front and sharing Jesus publicly. But for those who are intimidated to speak to strangers, you can just as simple as just sharing literature wherever you go and you don't even have to talk to people leave them in places like public restrooms and leave them on cars i want to share with you one of my favorite glow stories a filipino church member from san francisco was on her way into work and stopped by a gas station seeing lots of people inside she pulled out some glow tracks to pass out to the men inside she didn't realize it but the three men in the store were actually robbing the gas station as she walked in she asked Excuse me, sir, are you in line? I'm going to be late for work. Are you dumb, lady? This is a robbery. The man said whose gun was in the back of the owner of the store. Now, you just imagine if you have a gun in, the, in your back. I know, but I'm going to be late and I need to pay for my gas. The man began a slew of cursing. That wasn't very nice. Here, she pulled out her first glow track. You need this. This will help you become a nicer man. Are you serious, lady? And then the man started yelling. You need one too, sir. She pulled out the next track. This poor man is just trying to make a living. You need to leave this poor nice man alone. With that, she handed the last burglar a track. The men were dumbfounded and began to get nervous. This lady talks too much. She's going to turn us in. Let's go. They ran out the front door, leaving only the church member and the owner of the store. When they were gone, the owner said, you saved my life. I could feel the gun in my back. You saved my life. What is it that you have? What did you give them? I want to know more about this. She handed the man a track. He asked for more tracks so he could pass them out to people in his store. Needless to say, I don't recommend that you look for armed robbers to pass out your glow tracks. But God will give us the boldness we need when the situation calls. As it says in Proverbs 28, 1, the righteous are as bold as a lion. Now, what do I do in my dental office? I have a picture that I like to show of the cabinet right behind my desk. It's my favorite part of the office because it's filled with firepower. It's all the different types of literature that I have, steps of Christ, uh, great controversies and glow tracks, and I have different stuff. Now, what do I like to give to my patients? I don't give literature out to someone I just met usually because the key is what is it? I want to win their confidence first. And so I check to make sure there's someone I either have had an amazing in encounter with if it's the first time, or someone I've had as a patient for a number of years, and the timing is just right. And if I have one choice of one literature to hand them, my top choice is a great controversy, and I'm going to tell you for two reasons. One is, when you study the parable at the end of Matthew, the faithful and wise servant is sharing meat in due season. Meat, which is the word of God in due season, represents a specific time. It's present truth. You and I, living at this time of Earth's history, ours is to share present truth. And the great controversy in this one book has all the present truth in this book. So if I can hand out one book, that's the book that I want to hand out. Secondly, Sister White has a quote, and she says this. Listen very carefully. It is true that some who buy the books will lay them on the shelf or place them on the parlor table and seldom look at them. Still, God has a care for his truth, and the time will come when these books will be sought for and read. Sickness or misfortune may enter the home, and through the truth contained in the books, God sends to troubled hearts peace and hope and rest. His love is revealed to them, and they understand the preciousness of the forgiveness of their sins. Thus, the Lord cooperates with his self-denying workers. So the thing is, the point is, you may give someone a great controversy. They may not even read it, but as long as it's in their home, down the road, when the timing is right, God can move upon their hearts, and they'll read the book. There was a lady in Sacramento. She lost her husband. Sometime later, she lost her job. Everything seemed to be falling apart. She came home. She sat down. She looked on the shelf. She happened to see a great controversy. She read it. And now she's a member of one of the local churches here in Sacramento. And if you've heard the story of David Asherick and John Bradshaw, very similar stories. Because someone gave them a great controversy, they didn't read it the first time. 
but because they had it. And so my goal is I want to get a great controversy into every home of every one of my patients that I can. And so when a patient is profusely thanking me after some procedure, like Dr. Kim, thank you so much. I go, I have something for you. And I go and grab a great controversy. And what I do is I just write my cell phone number in it. I come back and I say, here, this is my cell phone. And what I'm doing is I'm disarming them. Because, you know, when your dentist says, here's, your, here's my personal cell phone for you, you're like, oh, okay, thank you. So I hand them and I said, this is my cell phone. You can call me anytime you have an emergency. And by the way, this is one of my favorite books. And I may say different things. I may say, you know, this world is kind of crazy. You'll enjoy this book where I talk about what the book is about. I'll mention a few things. But my goal is to share this book and get this book out to my patients. Now, a woman called me out of the blue on my cell phone. She said, you gave me a book and your number was written inside. Could you give our family Bible studies? She told me that they've been trying to learn Bible prophecy on their own, and they were struggling to understand. Could you imagine trying to understand Bible prophecy on your own? I encouraged her to show up to my office in an evening. She came with her husband, two of her kids, and a daughter-in-law. And um, we started doing Bible studies together. And Sister White has a quote. I don't have it with me, but basically what she says is, those of us who understand these truths, that we are needed to help explain and teach others who don't know these truths. So what a special privilege you and I have. I swung by the hotel that my wife and daughter and I had stayed in over the weekend because my daughter had left her Sonicare toothbrush at the hotel. As I was walking in just outside the hotel, the hotel desk clerk says, you're the one who gave me something. I really liked it. He asked me what it was. He asked me if I worked for the church. I told him I had more. This time I gave him two more glow tracks and a Kingdom in Time magazine by Amazing Facts. I wrote my name and number and encouraged him to contact me if he had any questions. And I can tell you stories like that from the smoothie bar and from another uh, at the airport where people, they'll recognize you. And they'll be like, hey, you gave me something. And it gives me an opportunity to share something with them again. And keep in mind, with people like this, when I can, I want to leave them my number. So if they want Bible studies or they got questions, I can follow up with them. For every five glow tracks or pieces of literature you shared, if one person was saved into God's kingdom, would you do it? Of course we would. How about if for every 20 pieces of literature? How about if it was only one soul for every 100 pieces of literature, would you do it? Because the truth is we're not going to know until we get to heaven how many people have been saved by the literature that we have shared. It all depends on how much value you place on a soul. How much is a soul worth to you? Because souls is the currency of heaven. It is what heaven values most. Christ object lessons tells us at the foot of the cross, remembering that for one sinner, Christ would have laid down his life. You may estimate the value of a soul. Now, I'm going to skip this next part. I want to share with you one of my favorite glow stories of a man who loves Jesus with all his heart. And this story kind of underscores how much this man recognizes the value of a soul. My friend, I had shared the similar presentation in Idaho for a weekend revival. It was just one of the messages. And the next day, there was an EMT sitting at my table for breakfast, and he wanted to share with me his favorite glow story. And so he told it to me because he was there. And he is an advanced EMT, Seventh Day Adventist. And one day they got a call in for someone who was struggling with breathing. Now, this can mean a lot of things. It could be very serious or it could be not very serious at all. And he has a partner, and they headed towards this house together in the ambulance. His partner is a former Adventist who has little interest in spiritual matters. And as Jamin describes, can come across as very rough around the edges if you didn't know her. When they arrived at the home and began walking in looking for the patient, Jamin noticed a Daniel prophecy timeline as well as the Ten Commandments on the wall. It's pretty obvious when you've got those two things, chances are high, they're Seventh-day Adventists. Even before he got to the patient, he could hear the patient's lungs filling up with fluids, indicating that this guy was knocking on death's door. Jamin recognized that this old man will die unless treated immediately. The man was in his underwear, leaning forward and only able to speak one to three word sentences. And he was an older gentleman, close to probably in his 80s. 
they need to get this done on medications and to the hospital right away or he will die. However, the old man insisted that they get him a shirt. There was no time for this. Getting him a shirt was ridiculous because as soon as they get in the ambulance, they're going to rip that shirt off anyway. They're going to cut it off. However, because the old man was so insistent, Jamin went to find him a shirt, if for anything, just to get this old man to cooperate. As soon as they got him inside the ambulance, they needed him to start breathing in albuterol via a nebulizer mask. And the only way this medication works is if the patient is breathing in the medication via the vapors. The patient absolutely cannot talk in order for this medication to work. While they are trying to get the patient to breathe in the vapor, he pushes the mask away while they are trying to get him to keep the mask on. And he says to my friend, Jamin, do you know Jesus? To which Jamin replies, yes, I'm Adventist. While trying to get the mask back onto the elderly man's face, he then tried to tell Jamin how excited he was that an Adventist was helping him. Again, Jamin had to put the mask back on the man's face, explaining that the medicine can only work if he is breathing it in deeply and doesn't speak. The patient then pushes the mask off his face again and says to Jamin's female partner, do you know Jesus? The very unreligious female partner replies, I've heard of the guy. As mentioned, this gal is very rough. She's repeating to the old man that he needs to keep the mask on and keep breathing exasperated she says to him if this doesn't if this doesn't work we will have to intubate you while struggling to get the old man to keep the mask on his face and keep breathing as his life is at stake the old man then reaches into his shirt pocket with such a small amount of strength he had to grab a glow track to hand it to the female paramedic she responded to him and said i will read this if you stop talking the old man is literally knocking on death's door. If not treated, he could die. And all he could think about is making sure he can witness and share Jesus up to his final moments. And of all the different kinds of glow tracks, he happened to pull out the one that has flames on the cover, a myths about hell track. Jamin was thinking of all the tracks to randomly grab. That is the one. Here we are afraid we might lose this guy because we are nearly 30 minutes from the hospital. And he is thinking he might lose an opportunity to lead someone to Jesus if he dies too soon. Jamin told me, the old man must have glow tracks in all of his shirts as he just grabbed a random shirt he, that he could find. He also told me the glow track floated around their office for a while, possibly because people are reluctant to throw away anything that might be religious. Let me tell you this, you share literature, and I guarantee you, it will make you happy or your money back. See, when we accomplish a goal-oriented task, our brain gives us a hit of dopamine. This is why we feel so good when we complete our to-do list for the day. We get a fulfilling sense of accomplishment. You guys all know what that's like, right? Every, you know, you have a day off and you have a list of all these things you got to do. And when you finish it, you're like, wow, that was very satisfying. Versus you could spend two hours looking at junk on social media and afterwards very unsatisfying. Marathon runners, every time they pass a mile marker, they get a hit of dopamine. And when they finish a marathon, they get a big blast of dopamine for completing the race. I will tell you, every time you pass out glow, you're accomplishing a goal-oriented task, and you will get a hit of dopamine. Try it for yourself and see if it doesn't make you happy. I get off an airplane. I'm tired. My mood might just kind of be meh. I go straight, and as soon as I start handing out glow tracks, leave it in the bathrooms. You know what? My mood is already going up. And I'm happy and satisfied. Now, last summer, my, uh, my daughter was sharing with my wife and I about her day. She was just telling us she was going somewhere and she needed to use a restroom. So she stopped by a Quiznos to use the restroom. She said, can I use your restroom? And they said, well, you have to buy something. She said, that's fine. So she used the restroom. And then what she did is she bought a soda because it's the cheapest thing on their list of things to buy. As she was driving out of the parking lot where the Quiznos was, she looked in her mirror and there was a homeless man sitting next to the building. So she backed up the car, opened the window, and she asked the homeless man, would you like a soda? To which the homeless man agreed. And in Sacramento, it gets really hot, easily over 100 degrees most of the summer. He agreed. So what she did was she backed up. She grabbed the glow track that was in her door. 
which daddy puts in her car. And then she handed the homeless man a glow track and a soda. Now, I want to tell you three reasons why this little story my daughter told me made me so happy. First, my oldest daughter is pretty fairly health conscious. and She doesn't really care to drink soda, so that makes daddy very happy. Second, she could have just threw away the soda, but instead of wasting the soda, hey, why not give it to a homeless man? They're drinking a lot of stuff that's worse anyways. And on a hot day, she just gave this homeless man something to drink. And of course, the best part is that she was willing to take the extra one or two seconds is all it took to grab that glow track and hand that glow track to the homeless man. Because see, the soda is fleeting, but the glow track can connect the homeless man to Jesus. When my daughter told my wife and I the story, my response was, I can die happy today. I was so happy. The story made me so happy. If this, and I thought to myself, if this small little thing can make that my daughter did can make me this happy, how happy must it make Jesus when he sees us engaged in sharing his love with his children who are lost? It was a beautiful reminder to me that when we are engaged in sharing Jesus with others, that it brings joy and happiness to God. And as we do this, we can lessen or lighten the pain in God's heart. Brothers and sisters, it's a whole nother topic, so I'm not going to talk about it. But you have no idea how much pain is in God's heart as he sees all the suffering and the sins and the ugly things and the evil in this world. And here you and I have a privilege and honor that we can lighten that pain in God's heart when we share literature and we're sharing Jesus with those in our sphere of influence. As we come to a close, I want you to imagine with me one day you and I are in heaven and someone comes up to you with tears in their eyes and they say, you know, you don't know who I am, but I want to thank you so much. I was going through a very difficult time in my life and I said, God, if you really exist, I need you to show yourself to me because you took the time to leave a piece of literature on my car. I came to know Jesus and it changed my life and that's why I am here today. But your efforts didn't only change my life because of you, my wife, and children are here with me. And I brought 36 people with me to heaven. So life is short. We are living on the cusp of eternity. And what a simple and what, a, what an incredible way we have. And so I want to challenge and encourage all of you guys to um, share literature. I saw earlier someone posted. You just go on glowonline.org and you can order glow tracks online. I work with ASI and right now we're creating a whole new set of cards. I had pictures of it I wanted to show you, but they're basically just business cards. Nowadays, what a lot of ministries are doing is they have cards with a question on it and on the back is a QR code. So you can think of it as a digital literature. It's hard to come up with a new name these days for a project. And so the name that I believe God gave to us, they're called LOA cards, L-O-A. Rolls off your tongue, sounds like aloha. You know, we live in a time where people use words like Viber and Yahoo and Google and Uber. So LOA stands for leaves of autumn because Ellen White told us we're supposed to scatter literature like the leaves of autumn. They're beautifully designed cards. They look like cards you would see in an upscale hotel. They have many different topics um, and a QR code, which can link it to sermons. It can link it to presentations, video, uh, songs, videos, all kinds of different things. We're um, partnering with Amazing Facts because they are the right arm of the gospel. I'm sorry, they're, they're the evangelism arm. And then we're partnering with Amen Ministries because they're the medical missionary work. So we want to partner with the right arm of the gospel. And uh, you're going to hear more about it. So I'm just giving you guys just a, a snippet about the Loa cards. I love it. Someone put Law of Love. Um, laugh out loud. Um, law, Loa stands for many other things like Lord of All law of attraction love one another but for our situation that stands for um leaves of autumn anyways thank you so much it's been a blessing